Hey everyone, welcome to Sunshine Hills Church Online. So glad you're joining with us today. Just want to let you know about a couple big things that are coming up. We are excited to have big events back on the calendar and times away together. So uh, VBS registration is open. If you have kids and you want to get them signed up for VBS, it's the third week of July this summer. That registration is currently open and you can message Victoria for all the details or check out the information on the church website. Facebook group, etc. Also, as of today, uh, Lower Mainland Foursquare Kids Camp registration is also open. There's a one-week uh, registration period for early bird rates, so make sure you get signed up this week if you're interested in getting your kids to go to camp. You can register up until camp, but for the early bird rate, it's this week. Uh, message Victoria for more information or talk to myself or Matthew or call the church office. We'd love to give you the information to get your kids to camp this summer. We've been missing camps. So good to have them back on the calendar this year. And then women, just let you know, uh, retreat is a go at Kakawa. Everything's been cleared for our group size, so we will be there uh, for the women's retreat at the end of May. So if you have not signed up yet, you can still do that, and we'd love to have you be a part of women's retreat this year. Make sure you sign up for that. Uh, those are what's coming up. As always, check our website, check our Facebook group, check our weekly email to see what we have going on. So much is happening, and we are excited uh, to offer these things for you to be a part of. For today, we have a very special guest speaker. Uh, my wife, Erica Jones, is going to be speaking to us today. She is a gifted communicator. She is passionate about seeing the church and all of us step into all that God has for us. So I'm excited for us to hear the word that God has laid on her heart for today. Hope you are excited as well, because church starts now. Good morning. So I want to start by saying that this isn't fully my comfort zone. So I'm going to pretend that you're a bunch of teenagers in a, a room like how we used to teach or at, at a youth camp setting, and there's just a, a couple of you around a campfire. So um, I, when I was asked to speak uh, by the Dannys, I was hoping that it was like, okay, here's a chapter of the Bible. So I thought, you know, we just did Mark. So, you know, maybe there's a Mark 17. Uh, spoiler alert, there's not. So I... When we, Danny and I started talking about what was passionate or what God's been speaking to me, I've been wondering why we don't talk more about the Holy Spirit in church. Now, our church does a, a really good job of doing that. We, we do allow for time for gifts of the Spirit and, and words. Um, but I, I have always just, for a long time, I felt like there is more. And I've wanted opportunities to speak to um, the church and, and, and people individually about what it looks like to exercise and walk in the fullness of God. So I grew up in a Christian home. I know that that's not news to a lot of you, but my parents were the pastors here since 1982, and I came at about six weeks old. So I'll pause while you do that math. And there was always a comfortability with the spirit and with, our, with the church in general, and it wasn't weird for me to talk about spiritual things. Um, but as we started doing youth ministry and talking with people, and as I've had conversations with people who are newer in their faith, the Holy Spirit is one of those kind of forgotten aspects of God. Um, we, we talk about it, but we kind of feel uncomfortable, or we don't know how to describe it in a good way. So this morning, I really want to unpack the Holy Spirit and, and how he can impact your everyday life. Um, I always enjoyed teaching and encouraging others in their gifts, so I'm not saying I'm an expert, but I do feel really passionate about this. I, I believe that church is meant to walk in authority and confidence in what we were given. So let's pray. God, I thank you for this time that we're able to be together, and, and Father, that for each person on the other end of that screen, God, that you would speak to them. Holy Spirit, that you would reveal yourself to them, that this wouldn't be uncomfortable, scary, unknown, but God, um, that you would reveal yourself in all parts to us. Um, and I just pray as I speak, God, that you would just start to stir a passion for your name, a passion for your spirit, and that we would be um, people that are impactful in our walk with you. In Jesus' name. So I want to start with a couple years ago, uh, we went on a missions trip to the Dream Center in um, downtown LA. So Dan and I had the privilege of driving a small team to, um, to where everything takes place. So um, the founder of our Foursquare um, churches, her name is Amy Semple McPherson, and she is, first of all, she's a female, so that alone is super inspiring to me. She's a Canadian woman, and I grew up on the stories of her because my grandparents knew her personally, and there is something about her that just really 
moves me and, and touches me. And, and this wasn't all that long ago. This isn't, you know, in the 30s and 40s. And, and we went to this Dream Center uh, missions trip. And we got the privilege of going to her parsonage where she lived. And it was right beside Angela's Temple. And we walked through and we heard the stories of Amy. And it, it kind of reminded me of these stories that my grandparents had told me about of this woman who had this incredible passion for God. And God really touched um, people through her. If you haven't heard some of her stories, they're absolutely some of the best things that you'll ever hear. So she did a sermon where it was called Arrested for Speeding, and she showed up in a police outfit, and she rides a motorcycle right into the middle of the church temple. Like, these are things that aren't done. Uh, some other stories I remember is that the hospitals actually began to drop off the ambulances at the church because they knew that healing took place there. So this is a woman that started the, the denomination that we are a part of. Um, and our logo, uh, we don't have it anywhere here, but the logo represents four roles of Jesus. The Savior, Baptizer with the Holy Spirit, Healer, and Soon Coming King. So I know that if you ask people on the street or we have a conversation, you know who God is. God is the Father. He's the 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 one that probably people have either a, a, a lack of understanding fully, but they do know who God would be. And then we talk about Jesus. So Jesus is, again, probably not as much of a mystery. At the very least, people know he was a man. He was born in a stable. You know, most people know the Christmas story. Likely they know that he died on the cross and that Christians believe that he rose again. But when it comes to the Holy Spirit... I, again, I grew up in the church, so it was kind of reserved for special times. So Holy Spirit, yes, we did the words, and we do a great job here. But there was something that we always knew that there was going to be more to do with the Holy Spirit at retreats or camps. So we, uh, I was a youth, Dan and I were youth pastors for quite a few years and youth leader before that, and I grew up going to camps. And we always joked about that we knew when the Holy Spirit night was coming. So it's always the last night of camp. So the first night's the intro night. The second night's the come to Jesus night. So you get to know the salvation message. And as the week goes on, it's building to this final night. Um, and along with our four-score camps, we also always did either tubing on the lake or we would do uh, water slides. So it was always a fun game um, as youth leaders that we would say, okay, you know, what of this emotion is tiredness and, and being at the water slides and what of this is, is really the moving of the Holy Spirit. But, we, but God moved and the Holy Spirit showed up in a powerful way and we saw kids... Um, walk in gifts and experience the Holy Spirit in, in a fresh way, and it was so exciting. So I want to talk about the Holy Spirit in our everyday life. So, you know, on, on a, a Sunday to Sunday and um, in our everyday life and, and what it looks like to walk in the fullness, that's really where my passion is. So to catch you up on the series that just finished, we did the whole book of Mark. So on Easter Sunday, Pastor Danny talked about the 14th chapter of Mark, or 16th chapter of Mark, and he went through and he, he talked about what happened there. So we've got Jesus revealing himself to Mary Magdalene, and then he reveals himself to the 11 disciples, and he gives them the Great Commission. So that, that sermon is on um, YouTube if you'd like to watch it. So I just want to put ourselves there for a minute. We've got our 11 disciples. So, you know, they were physically without Jesus for three days, and it wasn't a very good three days. It was probably the worst three days that they'd had. And then he comes back, and they're like, okay, everything's fine now. So we've got Jesus. We're good to go. He's here. You know, all is well. But then Jesus says that he has to leave again. And I imagine in my head kind of a meltdown of sorts. You know, that why can't you stay? And that's how my kids go when I'm about to go somewhere too. So I'm picturing, you know, why can't you stay? Cause stay with us. And so he actually says in John 16, 7, however, I'm telling you the truth. It's good for you that I'm going away. If I don't go away, the helper won't come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And then in verse 12, it says, I have a lot more to tell you, but that would be too much for you now. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into the full truth. He won't speak on his own. He will speak what he hears, and he will tell you about things to come. He will give me glory because he will tell you what I say. Everything the Father says is also what I say, and this is what I said. He will take what I say and tell it to you. So up to this point, the Holy Spirit is only kind of revealed in, in pockets, or um, as we like to say in, in Bible college, it, it really it appeared to be that the Holy Spirit was only with one person at, one, at a time. So I wanted to talk briefly about what the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament looked like. So he's right off the bat, we've got the Holy Spirit right in Genesis 1, and he's in the creation story. So Genesis 1, 2, it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and empty, the darkness covered the deep waters, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the water. So here we have them right off the bat. It's not forgotten or, you know, later on in a footnote. It's right off the bat in the beginning of the Bible. 
And then it talks about in Psalm 33, 6, um, it talks about the wind or the breath. So a lot of the times when we hear the breath, the Hebrew word for that can be um, translated as spirit. So in Psalm 33, 6, it says, By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, and all the host of them by the breath or the spirit of his mouth. So I have a couple of examples here of where the Holy Spirit rested on people. So we've got Moses in Numbers eleven twenty five. Then the Lord came down in the cloud and spoke with him. And he took some of the power of the Spirit that was on him and put it on the 70 elders. When the Spirit rested on them, they prophesied, but they didn't do so again. So here we've got a little taste. I can't imagine what it would be like to have the taste of prophecy and the taste of the Holy Spirit with us. And it was just for a moment and then it left. Then the Spirit came on some judges, warriors, and prophets and gave them extraordinary power. Uh, we see that in Joshua in Numbers 27, 18. So the Lord said to Moses, take Joshua, a man of whom is the spirit of leadership, and lay your hand on him. We see it with Othniel. He's a member of the tribe of Caleb. He delivered the Israelites from eight years of oppression. It says in Judges 3, 10, the spirit of the Lord came on him so that he became Israel's judge and went to war. We see it with Gideon, which is one of the most exciting stories in the Old Testament in Judges 6, 34. He was the fifth judge and military and prophet who's calling a victory over the Midianites is one of the most incredible miracles. It says in Judges 6, 34, then the spirit of the Lord came on Gideon. We've got Samson, and again, most people know from the Bible stories of kids about his hair, but he was the last judge. It says in Judges 13, 25, and the spirit of the Lord began to stir in him. And then in 14.6, the spirit of the Lord came powerfully on him. So it had nothing to do with his physical gifts or his physical abilities, even though he was a strong man. God actually breathed his spirit on him. And then we've got Saul in 1 Samuel 10, 9 to 10. When Saul turned around to leave Samuel, God changed Saul's attitude. That day, all the signs happened. When Saul came to a hill, a group of prophets came to meet him, and God's spirit came over him, and he prophesied with them. And then, in, of course, there's David, and it says, He speaks, the spirit of the Lord spoke to me, and his words were on my tongue. And Ezekiel, the spirit entered me when he spoke to me. So we see um, examples of, of people in the Bible where it specifically talks about the spirit coming upon them. So going back to Mark 16, Jesus is saying, it's actually in John, but Jesus says, it's good that he goes away and that he leaves his helper. So this is a really big deal. He's saying, I'm one person. I'm physically here with you. I can be here with you, or I can go and my spirit can be with each one of you. This is a huge promise and a very powerful one. This is no longer just the chosen ones. This is all of us. And in order for us to walk in the fullness, we need to have an understanding of what that can look like. After Jesus leaves, there's a real surge of his presence, of the Holy Spirit moving. The disciples are feeling empowered, and they're confident in that power. Jesus says in John 14, 12, The person who follows me in faith, believing in me, will do the same mighty miracles that I do, even greater miracles than me. So now we know the Holy Spirit has been left for all believers. We know that the disciples experienced the fullness of the Holy Spirit in their days, and we saw, him, and he, and we saw them perform great miracles through the Holy Spirit. So fast forward to today. We know the same power that conquered the grave is in me. But how do we activate that? How do we reach the fullness of this gift? So first, this is where my teaching hat comes in. I'm here to say that you don't have to be at a special service camp or retreat to be released in these gifts. The Holy Spirit wants to do that here and now. If you're in your living room, if you're watching this on your phone, for those of us that will be together on a Sunday morning, the Holy Spirit wants to move powerfully. And it doesn't have to be, you know, at this time in this way. I'm a type A personality that really, I would want to be control over that. But the Holy Spirit can and will come wherever he wants and however he wants in a powerful way. I actually started speaking in tongues for the first time at 7. I was downstairs in this very building. And God bless the teacher, but I walked up, and we had just done some worship, and we were doing kind of an exercise, and I began to bubble up with this, um, this language that I didn't understand, and I went flying over to the teacher, and I said, I'm speaking in tongues, and they, well-knowing, and, and again, it just is bad teaching or whatever, and they looked at me, and they said, you can't. Nobody prayed for that. And I went, oh, okay, I guess I, ha I wasn't speaking in tongues. So I kind of left that for a little bit, and then as I continued, um, at camps in particular or as I was laying in my bed, I would feel and, and hear these sounds, and I would start to speak, and, and then I was prayed over, and I began to talk to people in my life that were mentoring me, even, you know, that again, this would have been like 10, 11, 12, and it occurred to me that it absolutely was me speaking in tongues at that young age, and it was, again, not a, a it wasn't somebody trying to squash anything. It was just maybe a lack of understanding, so I want to tell you one thing really important. When you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, 
you have also received the Holy Spirit. There isn't a special clause that says, okay, you accepted Jesus. Now you have to do X, Y, and Z to receive the Holy Spirit. It comes at the same time. However, there is something important about acknowledging that you want to act in your gifts. It's like saying, okay, I, I know that that's there, but I'm choosing to walk in it. So let's break things down. So I'm going to do this in two parts. The first is speaking in tongues. I believe that this is for every believer. In Mark 16, 17, it says, These are the miraculous signs that will accompany believers. They will use the power and authority of my name to force demons out of people. They will speak new languages. They will pick up snakes. And if they drink deadly poison, it will not hurt them. They will place their hands on the sick and cure them. In 1 Corinthians 14, 2, it says, When someone speaks in tongues, no one understands a word he says because he's not speaking to people. But to God, he's speaking intimate mysteries in the Spirit. So I want to break down a couple of things. If you haven't spoken in tongues, it does not mean that you do not have Jesus as your Lord and Savior, that you've done anything wrong, or that you aren't a proper Christian. In my experience, both from when I was a kid and from being a youth leader for so long, we overcomplicate this. Speaking in tongues is when our spirit is talking directly to God. It's when we don't have words, and it's a direct line from our spirit to God's. Some other things about speaking in tongues. God knows what you are saying, but you don't. You can pray in tongues in your head. This was another thing I thought, if I'm not speaking it, then I'm not, I'm not praying in tongues because my head could also go back and forth between praying in the spirit and then hearing my, my head voice saying things. And so I thought, okay, this can't be it. But because your spirit is talking to God, you can even be thinking other things while you do it. The most exciting thing that I found out recently was that Satan cannot understand what you're praying. So when you're speaking words and you're praying them, Satan can say, that's a lie, or you don't believe that. But when you're speaking from spirit to spirit, there is no understanding on his part. So that gives us a, a direct advantage. And it's also like anything else. So this is where I, this has been my personal experience. This is not, uh, you know, anywhere in a textbook, but my personal experience has been that there's different ways of speaking in tongues. Sometimes it's literally just a phrase that you repeat over and over and over and over. And as you practice, more words come, just like a, a language or if you do Duolingo or you, you're learning Italian, you don't learn to just rattle off all Italian in one sitting. There are other times where people just get the fullness of it. It bubbles out of them and they just have all of these words. Another thing that I noticed as I develop this and pray in tongues more in my personal life is in certain times it, the different sounds or words come out. There's also like an urgency that comes out. So when I was praying and believing for healing for people or I knew like there was just like a gut sound that was coming out that was different than when I was praising in tongues. So it's a good idea to do this in all times when we're together and we're in a Sunday morning, allowing yourself to do that in praise. When you're praying for somebody and you don't have words and you're interceding, those are all places where it's really good to pray in the spirit. Um, so next is there is um, in 1 Corinthians 14, Paul actually talks a lot about this. And he says that actually speaking in tongues isn't quite enough. He actually phys he says here, he says, that enriches you, but what good is it if I come to you always speaking in tongues? So there's two parts of this sermon or this message this morning. In 1 Corinthians 14, 12, Paul says, you are so passionate about embracing the manifestations of the Holy Spirit, but now become even more passionate about the things that strengthen the church. So the speaking in tongues is your personal language. That's for you and God. That's to uh, develop your faith, to intercede for people, to have those personal and, and, and intimate moments with God. But then there's the, the gifts of the Spirit. So walking in the uh, fullness of spirit has the spiritual language to pray and intercede, and spiritual gifts are to serve the body of Christ and non-believers. So now we're going to unpack a little bit the, the idea of spiritual gifts. So the New Testament actually, it, it's kind of like popcorn. It pops in and out of different ideas. So when you hear about specific spiritual gifts, there's, there's multiple places in the Bible that it talks about that. It talks about certain gifts for certain believers, and um, again, in my experiences, you can grow in your gifts, your gifts can change, and gifts can come in certain seasons and situations. So there's going to be some dominant gifts that you're going to see coming out as you walk out in faith, as you say, you know, I know that this is an area where I am um, strong in, and I believe that God has gifted me in, and as you continue to walk in it, it will get strengthened. And then, as I was saying about the Dream Center, and when we were walking around, and, and we got to do some street ministry, and we got to serve people food. 
Um, and then in, in the times that I've done missions trips in Mexico, there are times where certain spiritual gifts are going to just come and pop up and you're just going to experience things. So I've heard of stories of, of missionaries getting in a taxi and one of them being able to just speak the language of the person driving when they were in danger and them understanding. So, um, and then, you know, miracles. And uh, there was a time in Mexico where we went and we were serving food and there was a huge line of people at the end of the back and we were completely out of food. And we started to, it was Ed that had the idea to just start scraping the sides. And as we scraped the sides, there was enough food for them and there was no way physically that that would be enough. So that's an example of miracles where I wouldn't consider myself um, very high in the gift of miracles, but as you step out in faith and as you put yourself in positions for God to use the spiritual gifts, you're going to start to see some things pop up and you're going to see those gifts coming to the surface. So here's some things that you need to know. If you need it, it will come. The more you step out in faith, the more that you'll find opportunities. And put yourself in positions for that. Do missions trips. Do the Dream Center opportunities that we have. Go to the schools and walk around and pray and see what God has for you. So I want to talk about where we can find the spiritual gifts. In 1 Corinthians 12, it's very prominent. So 1 Corinthians 12, 1 to 2, and then 4 to 11. Brothers and sisters, I don't want there to be any misunderstanding concerning spiritual gifts. You know that when you were unbelievers, every time that you were led to worship false gods, you were worshiping gods who couldn't speak. There are different spiritual gifts, but the same Spirit gives them. There are different ways of serving, and yet the same Lord is served. There are different types of work to do, but the same God pr produces every gift in every person. The evidence of the Spirit's presence is given to each person for the common good of everyone. The Spirit gives one person the ability to speak with wisdom. The same Spirit gives another person the ability to speak with knowledge. To another person, courageous faith. To another person, the ability to heal. Another can work miracles. Another can speak what God has revealed. Another can tell the difference between spirits. Another can speak in different kinds of languages. Another can interpret languages. There is only one Spirit who does all these things by giving what God wants for each person. Then in, later on in 1 Corinthians 12, 27 to 30, it says, You are Christ's body, and each of you an individual part of it. In the church, God has appointed apostles, prophets, teachers, those who perform miracles, and those who have the gift of healing, and those who help others, those who are managers, and those who can speak in a number of languages. Not all believers are apostles. Are all of them prophets? Do all of them teach? Do all of them perform miracles? Do all have gifts of healing? Can any of them speak in other languages or interpret tongues? And then the third big chunk of um, scripture is found in Romans 12, 6 to 8. God in his kindness gave each of us different gifts. If your gift is speaking what God has revealed, make sure you say what agrees with the Christian faith. If your gift is serving, devote yourself to serving. If it is teaching, devote yourself to teaching. If it is encouraging others, devote yourself to giving encouragement. If it is sharing, be generous. If it is leadership, lead enthusiastically. And if it is helping people in need, help them cheerfully. So if you go and you Google spiritual gift tests or you Google spiritual gifts, you're going to get a, a lot of teaching. Uh, Pastor Danny and Pastor Tom put together one. And then there's this one that we do that's a little bit simpler for um, younger people. And I found it really helpful. And you go through and there's all these questions. And you rate yourself from, you know, one, one to five as in, sorry, this one's three to, three to zero. So consistently or definitely true is a three and never not at all is a zero. Um, and the questions are things like, I can coordinate people, tasks, and events to meet a need. So you'd rate yourself on that. And then there's a chart. And then when you're done the chart, you're going to, um, there's going to be a list of the spiritual gifts. So this one is one that I really like. It's got administration, craftsmanship, creative communication, etc. We took out, I mean, again, you have to kind of know what you're doing so when we were when I was a teenager we would have a, a, um, a category that was celibacy and so some teenagers would be like I'm really high in celibacy and and so it's there's a lot of gifts that you can kind of poke out of the bible so we've made it really easy we've got this spiritual gift assessment for you and you can take it so my encouragement to you is um, if you're doing this online, we'll link to the digital one, or you can get one in a physical copy at the church, um, and we'll have one at the back for those of you that are going to be here on a Sunday morning. And I want to encourage you to take one. So one of the things that we said to our youth in particular or our youth leaders is you want to kind of do this every couple of years. And because, again, you, as you continue to walk out um, in faith, you're going to see some, some gifts come to the surface, or you're going to find that you're stronger in some gifts. 
you're going to want to take some time with God. You're going to want to go to a beach or, or go to the, um, go to the um, forest or sit on a porch with a coffee. Find somewhere where you can kind of do this in one chunk. <clears throat> And, and prayerfully consider the gifts that are there. Another thing when you do it is you want to kind of answer from your gut. You don't want to think about it a long time. Like, oh, yeah, one time I saw somebody get healed. So I obviously have the gift of healing. You want to kind of answer it based off of what has happened, not what you want to have happen. Um, now, the next step is once you've figured out what your gifts are, you don't want to leave them dormant. You don't want to be like, okay, I'm really good at leadership or I have hospitality gifts. Like, yay for me. This isn't specifically a volunteer message, but I'm still going to encourage you to think about where your gifts fit in, both in your secular jobs and then on a Sunday morning or in our church. In the church, we often fall into the 80-20 rule. Maybe there's already an established ministry that your giftings work really well in. So the 80-20 rule is 80% of the work is done by 20% of the people. I really believe that there's a place for you. You may go, okay, I, I can't sing, and I'm kind of shy, and I'm not good with kids, I, I believe both there is established ministries where you could fit, but I also believe that God is going to begin stirring in your heart a place or a ministry that we haven't even thought of. There are so many places that we can serve our community, and we need people that are saying, you know what, I, I don't really fit into these boxes of where the ministries are, but I have a passion for, for exercise. Maybe we can do an exercise group, or I'm a new mom and I'm really lonely. I'd love to just get together casually. That's how mom and tot groups get started. Maybe I want to get more involved with refugees or I want street ministries because, frankly, if we leave all of those things to our staff, it just there's too much to do too much of the time. So I want to encourage you that your gifts are meant to be used, and God has a unique place for you in this church. He has a unique place for you in your workplace, and he wants to take these spiritual gifts. He wants to take your heavenly language, and he wants to allow you to have a fullness in your, in your walk with him that is not just, you know, check off the box that I read my Bible today or I prayed for a couple of minutes, I'm good to go. God really wants for you to walk in the fullness of this. So I want to finish by reading 1 Corinthians 12, 12 to 20. This is the Passion Translation. Just as the human body is one, though it has many parts that together form one body, so too is Christ. For by one spirit we are immersed and mingled into one single body, and no matter our status, whether we're Jews or non-Jews, oppressed or free, we are privileged to drink deeply of the whole Holy Spirit. The fact that the human body is not one single part, but rather many parts mingled into one. If the foot were to say, since I'm not a hand, I'm not part of the body, it's forgetting it's still a vital part. And if the ear were to say, since I'm not an eye, I'm really not a part of the body, it's forgetting that it's still an important part of the body. Think of it this way. If the whole body were just an eyeball, how could it hear sounds? And if the whole body were just an ear, how could it smell different fragrances? But God has carefully designed each member and placed it in the body to function as he desires. A diversity is required. I love that line. A diversity is required. For if the body consisted of one single part, there wouldn't be a body at all. So now we see that there are many differing parts of function but one body. So my question for you this morning, this evening, whenever you're watching this, is do you want the fullness of what God has for you? I encourage you to say yes. Let's see where God takes us. If you haven't received the, the, your spiritual language, I, find an elder. Find me. I'll pray for you. It doesn't have to take long. It doesn't have to be this big production. I, I really believe that we've overcomplicated this. This is for every believer. And again, you don't have to have somebody pray for you. You can be in a worship service, and God can give you some of that, those starting words of your heavenly language. And God really wants to release this in you. I encourage you to take a gift test again, even if you've done one or if you've never done one. Uh, I encourage you to do this in a community. You can take two friends and do it or one friend or you and a spouse. Ask your life group leader if that's something that you can do because there's a lot to unpack here. So there's these, these tools that have these gifts. Um, you know, sometimes you go, okay, I have these things and now I don't know what to do with them. We're not leaving you high and dry. There's lots of opportunity for us to continue to have these conversations. I want to encourage you to See where God takes you, because I believe that this is only the start of what God has for us. So let's pray. God, I thank you for this time that we had together. And Father, I thank you that you give us gifts. Father, you're a good father. You want us to not be abandoned or, or left going, what about where's Jesus? What do I do now? You've left the Holy Spirit with each and every one of us. And so Holy Spirit, I pray that you would breathe in us, that you would move like a mighty wind through this place. 
through each and every spot that people are, God, that we would know that you have a, a, an individual calling for us, that you want to move us in a powerful way, that you don't want us to stay where we are. You want us to step out in our gifts, to step out in faith. And Father, I believe that as we begin to do that, you will see us rise up as an army for you. And Holy Spirit, that you would breathe new life in this place and new life in our families and in our personal lives, God, and that we would be a powerful vessel for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, church, that was such a good and encouraging word. I want to thank Eric again for uh, taking time to speak to us today. Um, yeah, if that was really just resonating with you and the Spirit spurring something within you, I want to reiterate what she said. Uh, avail yourself of the spiritual gift test we've been making available. We want to resource you with those things and uh, help you to walk into all that God has for you. Uh, if this whole conversation about the Holy Spirit and being empowered and the use of spiritual gifts is something that you would like to know more about, please contact the church office, one of our pastors, an elder, um, get plugged into a life group and have a conversation about it. We just want to uh, really encourage our church to dive deep into all that God has for us and to really not just have this go in one ear, but really take root in our hearts and our spirits and walk this out. So uh, what a great day together as a church. Uh, we look forward to seeing you all soon. As always, we love you guys. We care for you guys. Let us know if there's anything you need, uh, any prayer requests you might have, and we will see you soon. Have a great and blessed week, church.